Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Mexican Beauty, the Nature of Day of the Dead, presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Melissa Silva. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you for being here with us today. Over to you, Melissa. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, everyone who's watching. And let's start with this webinar. So, as Rob already said, my name is Melissa Silva. I'm a marine biologist, and I've been with NatHab for about 13 years, I think, if I remember correctly. But, um, well, I'm guiding uh, the Monarch butterfly trips that actually we're starting on December, um, and we are expecting a very good season. Uh, so, well, the topic today is uh, the nature of, of Day of the Dead, and uh, I will explain a little bit about the the tradition uh, and all of this because it's um, I think it's one of the most important traditions in Mexico, and it's uh, a national a, a global heritage from the UNESCO. So something very very neat to know about, and uh, I'm pretty sure you have heard. Uh, about uh, Day of the Dead, because now the pop culture took it uh, a little bit uh, in the Coco movie from Disney. So, well, it's the tradition and the beliefs are very similar. They have uh, it's a little it's accurate in cer certain things. Um, so, also, I'm pretty sure that you have heard and seen this uh, huge parade of Day of the Dead that was actually started or, or was it was created for the movie um spectre of the of james Bond series so the parade as a as a local uh, festivity or party or or celebration was not uh, done in such a big um display so the actual big parade started in in 2016 after the movies uh, uh, scenes. So this is one of the photos of this uh, parade that we just had this November, and uh, well, you can see they did uh, copy this uh, big structure, this big big um, we call those calaveras and calacas, the skulls and the and the skeletons. And as you can see, they are uh, like uh, scenes or or moments of the life that are shown with the with the big um uh calacas in here so uh there's also like a culture uh, parade because you can see besides like all the all the dead representations or all, all the day of the dead representations you can also see uh, folkloric dancers like these ones that are from jalisco state and you can see representation of um, of all the other states of of the country. So it's a, a very nice. Um, well, now it's it's becoming a tradition now, uh, and it's a very very important one because it activates the economy of the area as well. So whenever you have the chance to come on the first days of November, it it usually is the next weekend after day of the dead that is on the first and the second of november so the um the celebration of day of the dead in mexico is a syncretism a syncretism means that it's something that is mixed something that is has parts of different things in this case the the celebration has influence from the pre-Hispanic uh, rituals and from the Christian uh, rituals as well. More than Christian, the, specifically the Catholic Christian uh, rites. So uh, that's why we see, for example, the cross uh, represented in, in many areas, but also we see the skulls that are uh, something like very, very pre-Hispanic. So let me tell you a little bit about the pre-Hispanic origins of Day of the Dead, of the celebrations that they have um, a couple of thousand uh, years ago in the central part of Mexico mostly. And I specify central Mexico because on the Yucatan Peninsula, they actually have another celebration on the same dates that is called the Hanal Pichan, 
um, and that deserves its own uh, webinar, so I won't uh, mention more of that here. Uh, we leave it for, for later. So for the central cultures of Mexico, we can put them all together uh, within the Nahua, uh, Nahua origin. They um, had this uh, duality uh, in the cosmovision in the universe in which death is actually part of life and without uh, life cannot be dead, but also without death cannot be life. And that is because um, remember these cultures were very connected to the earth, very connected to nature. So they observe the natural cycles in, in, in their surroundings, in the environment. So they notice, for example, that there were uh, moments of rain where everything was blooming and then there were moments of, of drought, so everything was dying, was dry. So they saw these cycles of death and, and rebirth and once over another. So for the for the cultures on, on this part of uh, central Mexico, it was something very important and it was linked and, and could never be apart or separated one from the other. So on the cosmovision, the general cosmovision of these uh, cultures on central Mexico, is that we are on, on the level Earth, in, in the level zero, if you want to, to say to, to see it in that way, which is represented here with the, uh, the Templo Mayor, with the, the main major, major temple of um, Tenochtitlan of, of Mexico. And uh, for them, if you wanted to represent the land, you had the East in front of you because that was the most important a cardinal point because it's from where the um, sun rise. So uh, the east was the most important, and then well, from that they they will arrange the other cardinal points. Above Earth, there were uh, thirteen levels of uh, what now is translated as heavens, but uh, originally they are only overworlds. So, for example, the first overworld will, will have the clouds and the moon. The fourth will have the sun moving down there, uh, up there. Is the, the, the 13th level, the, the very the highest level of them all, will have will be the, the house of the duality uh, god or goddess. It's, it's a duality, so you can say it is a god or, or a goddess. Or, or medio can and uh, under our earth level there were nine levels that is considered the underworld all of them are called the mictlan and unfortunately through the through the translations or the the understanding of the catholic priests that arrived to to the in the aztec time to, during the conquer they translate that as the hell so they said, well, okay, just like the, the Christian concept of hell and heaven. So, but in reality, for the Mexicas, for all the Nahuas uh, cultures in central Mexico, the underworld was just an area where the dead used to go. There was no hell, there was no like punishment on the afterlife. And that is because they considered that justice was given on this level so if you were um, if you were a, a a thief or if you get drunk, for example, that was an offense, a very high offense to get drunk. Um, you get your punishment here. Once you died, you were uh, free to go, and the the idea was to become one with all. So something very similar to what Christian uh, Christianity was uh, talking about, like you become one to God, you become one with the everything so the type of that it's uh, it was the one that determined where your teyolia goes the teyolia here this word is not like the soul the spirit concept that we have uh, in the occidental world but it's more like the essence of the being so that's something that will never change it, you will be always your teyolia during your passage on the Mictlan, or if you go to other of the of the uh, uh, heavens, uh, you you tell will be the same, and that will be you. So there were actually four places, four main places in these levels that I mentioned before. 
where the death could be uh, could go depending on what the way they they die as i mentioned so the house of the sun tonatiu ichan um the in that place the the spirits the teoliad of mothers that died during childbirth and warriors that died on on battle or on the sacrifice that they were captured and sacrificed to to other gods their their essence will go to the house of the sun they will uh, go with the sun for example the warriors will will uh, go from sunrise to noon and then the mothers the, the spirit the essence of mothers will go from noon to uh, sunset and if they come back to the level if they come back to the the zero level the earth level they can become butterflies or they can become uh hummingbirds so actually um, in, in many cultures there's the idea that this kind of uh, of animals butterflies specifically here in the americas the hummingbirds birds as, as well that they were the spirits of uh, our relatives or our, or our ancestors or that they were um, able to take messages to the gods. So another place that a, a spirit or a, an essence from a person can go after dying was the Chichihuacuauco. I'm doing my best to pronounce those in those Nahuatl words, Chichihuacuauco. And that is a place on the on the highest level of the of the heavens, on the on the highest heaven where all the the infants or the newborns and the children who died without the name uh, ceremony uh, uh, moved so in this place there was a tree from where its branches had fruit in the shape of a breast from of, of a woman uh, breast lactating with milk you can see the representation on this detail here you can see the the branches red and, and black and then you can see the the fruit and some babies just uh, nursing from from this uh, tree and they were on that highest heaven waiting to come back to the earth because they didn't uh, complete the cycle of living a life on this level so they were waiting here this god the the depiction of this god on the on the left corner of of this image is the Skaltipoca. And he's considered also to be a, a god behind being god of, of the war and others, uh, a, a god of um, of renewal and rebirth as well. So this god will help these baby babies souls to come back to uh, to, to the earth to this level. Then another place uh, that was a Tlalocan, another place for for those that died. Uh, because of uh, something related to water, an accident or an illness, or um, if they got struck by a, by a lightning, for example, and they died, they go to the Tlalocan and they describe the Tlalocan as a place of, um, like an evergreen place of, of eternal summer with a lot of water, of course. You can see uh, this mountain here. This is a, a fresco painted on, on Teotihuacan. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. And this mountain here is just like made of water and is uh, kind of like a volcan volcano of water, uh, a water volcano. And you can see the people is swimming there. They are like having a great time. They are dancing. They have some uh, ball games. They are singing. You can see this like uh, we call those volutas. Um, th that means that it's either a words like like a speech or a, a chanting or, or song so in this case there are there is so many people with the same um representation of of speaking that means um they are singing and dancing then you can see there are a lot of flowers a lot of butterflies so it was basically what we can consider the paradise on the occidental este, tradition and then the the fourth other area the mictlan uh it was the place where all the the essences of or the souls of those people that die like in regular causes from from age or uh, in an accident related to something other than than water uh they fell from from a from a mountain or or, or another illness not related to water so 
the Miklan basically it's uh, the underworld and everyone except those chosen ones that I mentioned before will go over that. On the Miklan, there are nine different places that you have to transit. So basically you, when, when uh, on, the, on the Mexica cosmology or cosmovision, when you die, your spirit goes to the Miklan and you have to, I mean, it's like a must to transit these nine different levels. The first one I want you to keep in mind because I will mention it uh, later is Quintlan. You can see here with the glyph of a dog. And to complete all of these nine levels, there has to be a period of four years to arrive to the very last one that can be called is Mictlan or Ahonoposhkaloka. That it's basically, um, they describe this area as a place with several rivers and streams of very dark water. And as the spirit is passing by, it's cleaning itself and it can become one with the universe or with the, with the duality of, of God, God and Goddess that is down there on the Mictlan. There were very elaborated funeral rites and very complex ceremonies in the in the Mexica times in the central part of Mexico when a people uh, was uh, when a people died. There is very little like information of of all the cultures around the Aztecs because well for obvious reasons if you remember with the conquer uh, they born a lot of uh, the the codex a lot of the their writings or, or the sacred texts. So what we have now, what, what we know for sure is from what the priests, where the Catholic priests uh, ask the Indians to write and explain to them. So these people here, these, these women here that you can see crying and this one yelling and, and crying very, very, it's painful to see them. It is actually something like a, like a show. It was disrespectful to have like a, a mourning this deep for the for the for our relatives. So what they used to do is that they paid some. I think it's called a winner. No, bueno. See, like like crying, a professional crier, crying people. They they were paid to cry in when someone died because the the tears and the the screams, the all this yelling was considered to be an offering for the gods to accept the the teyolia, the, the soul of, uh, of the dead one. So it was a, a ritual crying that they did. And also in this other image on the left top, you can see these people um, preparing a body to be cremated and they placed something in their mouth. It was either an obsidian or a jade or any green uh, stone that represented the heart where uh, they consider the Teyolia was uh, said was living there. So um, let's say the, the spirit of a person was located on, this, on the heart and a green rock represented that. So um, they placed one of those in the mouth of the dead. So actually um, not all the people was, was uh, buried, not all of them were cremated. It, in that specific um, ceremony, it depended your uh, status, your social status, to be either one or the other. The Tlatuanis, like on this depiction, you can see the burial of the Tlatuani, of the Emperor Aguizotl. And uh, they were cremated with a lot of offerings. You can see there's a, a quail here, there's like a necklace, um, and all the, the, well, like the crowns they used to have. Uh, mentioning is it is the the Tlatuani, but also they had servants, slaves that were uh, sacrifice uh, killed in a sacrifice sacrifice uh, to go with them. Very similar to what the ancient Egyptian Egyptians did, like to kill other people to help you on the on the afterlife. So basically, it's the same. So they have this huge ceremony on the the day of the, the when they died when this person died but then the the rest of the people and also the 
the high class people, they had ceremonies every four years on the death anniversary of the of the relative, or in this case, for example, of the emperor. So every year during four years, they will celebrate, they will honor them, and they will have offerings, they will have food and, and uh, some servants to uh, offer to the Teryolian, to the spirit of the dead people for four years. So keep that number in mind as well, because I will mention that in a moment. But they also have um, the the central the the central cultures of of uh, the Mex the cultures of central Mexico, the ancient cultures had celebrations for the dead, like specific for the the dead people of their communities. Uh, I will try to pronounce that Mikhail Witontli and the Way Mikhail Way Mikhail Wit, something like that. So each one of those, it was either the minor festival to the dead or the major festival of the dead. That one, when the Spanish uh, uh, priests arrive here and they notice like the celebrations or how they associated, not for the kids or the adults, but like a big one and a not like a more regular or calm one. Uh, the, the minor festival is this one divided on the left. You can see some uh lines of flowers you can see flowers yellow flower purple flowers in this uh, uh, like vines uh, for for ornament so they noticed that they had this um coincidence let's say on the names of some of a couple of uh, celebration that the catholic uh, church already had which was the day of uh all Saints Day on November the 1st and All Souls Day on November the 2nd. And here I want to note something. Uh, the, the, a little bit more accurate translation for November the 2nd would be All Faithful Souls Day because it was uh, dedicated to the people that was Christian, that was Catholic, that they had a faith on the Catholic Church so if we, uh, there, there are some anthropologists that say, if we say like All Souls Day, they, they were um, dedicating that festivity to like all of our souls, but uh, it was actually dedicated only to the people that died on the, on the Catholic faith. So that, that was a parenthesis I wanted to, to mention. And uh, when they saw this, these two festivities that were so similar in what they, in their mind, they understood with November the 1st and the 2nd is when they decided to uh, make this syncretism for, uh, well, evangel uh, the, 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 okay, spread the gospel in, in Mexican land. Uh, in all of these celebrations, in the, in the fourth year, uh, yearly celebration of, of the dead, in the major and the, the minor festivals of the dead and other celebrations that they had in like yearly, they had about 18 different celebrations and only two were like dedicated to the to the dead. Um, the, the Nahua people, the people from central Mexico uh, elaborated something that is called Tlamanali. That is, this is a, a, an actual one that they are trying to uh, recover from, from the origins of this tradition. And this is the uh, basis or, or this is the original altar that we have now on the day of the dead. So with all this syncretism uh, th that we have now of the, of the Christianity of, of the Catholic church, we have now um, like a very elaborated way of celebrating or, or remembering our dead ones. Uh, this is, well, just a, uh, a drawing of, of an altar, very, very general general of what you can see in a house. You can see uh, sempasuchil uh, petals, you can see food, the candles, incense, uh, you can see the photos of the dead people, the ones that you are uh, setting the, the altar for. You can see personal objects. So basically the altar is where you put your ofrenda, your offering. The offering is everything you want to give or, or to offer to the soul of, of your uh, relative ones that um, 
well, according to the to the Nahua tradition, to the Mexica tradition, it will come in that time of the year uh, from the Mictlan. They will come to visit you to see if everything's okay. Just to um, some people actually say they come and give you your their blessing for your whatever you want to do, business, marriage, uh, the trip. So they offer uh, food in this uh, because of this reason to the people. So um, basically, this is like something very very general, the, the candy schools, the bread of the dead, pan de muertos, offer, you offer the fruit, uh, hot drinks, the hot, hot beverages like uh, hot chocolate can be, or can be coffee. Um, so it actually depends, it depends on what the dead people liked is what you offer in your, in your altar. Here, for example, I, I share a couple of altars from my family. This is, um, from my my mother-in-law, she placed this altar for her parents, and this is from my brothers-in-law that they uh, also place this altar for for her parents, for their parents. So you can see something that is uh, a must. You you must have the the sempa suchil flowers. You must have food. You must have drinks. Um, some people put uh, put some them uh, cigarettes. Um, like there, there's people that has placed their hamburgers or pizza because that's the food that they this is one liked. So it's something like you have to do very personal and um, as big as you want. Sometimes it's just one little table with the photo of the person, a couple of candles, water, uh, salt, and one or two uh, uh, pieces of food. So but the idea is to remember your your beloved ones, your ancestors, and to honor them, to celebrate their lives. Because of course, thanks to them, we are here on, on this level, on this earth. So well, now let's go to um, some specific parts of, of this uh, tradition, some specific parts of this uh, uh, natural parts of this tradition. Let me start with the Cholus Quintly, this Mexican hairless dog. Uh, I think this is my favorite dog ever because uh, as being, uh, since this is hairless, it's a little bit cleaner than other dogs with hair. Um, so, well, of, of course, you know, the domestication of dog was like tw okay, 15, 17 years uh, ago. But here in Mexico, the oldest register that uh, archaeologists have found is from a burial on uh, central Mexico, on Hidalgo state, uh, Cueva del Tecolote. Um, and it dates back more or less 5,000 uh, years ago. So they found two people and six dogs burial, uh, in a burial displayed in a certain way that it uh, gives some clues that it, this was part of a, of a ceremony, a special ceremony. And for the disposition of the dogs, they assume or they, they understand these uh, archaeologists that they were the guardians of these people and they were protecting the area where these bodies were placed. So remember that I mentioned, keep in mind the Squintlan and, and the nine levels of the Mictlan. And that is because um, on the very first one, the Squintlan, you have to go to get the help of a dog to cross the the river the very first river that you have to cross to go into the into the next level uh the dog in this case uh, for for this uh, belief is your guide and it will be your company in the on, on the afterlife so on all the nine levels the dog will be with you can help it can be helping you but um they said that only those who were kind to dogs in life will cross the river. So uh, the the dog actually in the in the central part of Mexico in the Nahua cultures had a very important um, level or, or had a very uh, este, it, it was in very high consideration because it was the helper for the afterlife. When the when the Spaniards arrived to Mexico, they found three different 
dogs that they have never seen back on, on, on Spain, on the Iberic Peninsula. The local people, the, the Mexica people, call them Squintly, which is this one here up on the on the top of the three images. The Chol is Quintly, which is this one on the middle and the big image, and the Tlalchichi. So they um they describe these dogs as being the squintly, just like a regular dog with hair, pretty much like those mixed breeds that we have. Uh, that we adopt sometimes, some from the stray dogs, it's very similar to that, like regular size, hair. Um, they describe them to be either like black with uh, with some patches of gel of um, orange and white, or to be completely like yellowish oranges, just like regular uh, mixed dogs. Then they describe the Cholus Quintly to be also a medium size dog but hairless so that that's why they were so surprised of, of seeing that one a hairless dog and then they describe the lalchichi to be a shorter dog it can either be hairless or with hair and the ancient uh, mexicas used to feed them to to grow them to eat they were actually considered a part of the of the edible fauna of the pre-Hispanic areas here. And according to, to, su, to some researchers, the Tlalchichi is the, the ancestor of the Chihuahua dog that we have now. So if you have a Chihuahua, you can see if, uh, if they do look like the, the ancient Tlalchichis, shorty, fatty, and very noisy. And well, they were, uh, besides being food in this case they were very important uh, for the for the spiritual world but also uh, as as a way of uh, companion you can see this i just love this sculpture here because it's a woman holding a dog and doing what a lot of people do nowadays kissing the dog on the mouth so it's one of the it was one of the greatest actions or or acts of uh, like place mouth to mouth with on any other being um, because well the breath is the, the, the breath of life is right there so uh, here we have this woman with the dog kind of like they are dancing or something like that then we have this um, this sculpture on the left that it was a, a temple ornament so they had ornaments in the shape of dogs this one you can actually see the wrinkles on uh, its skin that tell us that it doesn't have any hair so you can actually see like the skin on on its body and they were placed either right next to the altars on the on the temples or uh, at the entrance of the houses uh, as a way of protection uh, uh, for the people and also uh, they had uh, the shape of vessels or the shape of uh, jars as well to get to keep um incense well copali Indian, and uh, it can actually be used to help the blood of the sacrifices. And it was so important, as I am saying all this time, that they were actually a replacement for humans on sacrifice. So just for, forget about the occidental vision of, of the sacrifices and this. Imagine you are a, a Mexica people, a central Mexican people, and then is the god the, the gods and the goddess are like the the most important uh, entity in the world after that it's the human uh, so we've sacrificed the mexica sacrificed the human to feed the gods the goddess but then you have a dog that can actually replace a human on the sacrifices so imagine the level of importance that this animal had to be considered equal to the human very similar to what we we have now with with a lot of our of our pets in this case um this uh, image here you can see the the sculpture it's a dog smoking smoking tobacco and uh, it's because of the phallic uh, description here it is thought to be related to some rituals for fecundity for fe fertility so well as as everything i said 
when the Spaniards arrived here, they noticed the, the dogs were very important. They were considered basically a god uh, or a demigod. Uh, they were eaten. Uh, so they actually banned them from like the land. They said like, no, you cannot have them as pets. You cannot have them as a, as a sacrifice. No, they, we don't want these dogs. And they, they actually ordered some uh, killings of dogs in the early, uh, uh, in the in the mid 1500s. So um, they almost got extinct, but they were already discovered on the highlands of Guerrero and Oaxaca states in the late 1800s. And from there, we have a, a slow progressive uh, recovery. So of course, the, the more uh, characteristic feature of this dog is that they don't have hair. Uh, but that is because of a, of a mutation on their genes. So this mutation makes them to be without the, the hair, but also makes them lose some of their teeth. As you can see, this one is almost toothless because they lost, um, they lose this, uh, the, the second molar or the third molar, the second molar, I think. And the purest the breed is, the less, Teeth they will have, so they can actually lose uh, canines, or they can lose like the whole uh, tooth teeth on on its mouth in its mouth. Nevertheless, there are uh, like a variety or or a recessive ha is the gene of a hair cholos quintlet. You can see here this one is from from uh, a small uh, size. You have one with a hair and one Cholos Quintle hairless. So if you see the hairy one, it looks very similar to the Chihuahua dog. And that is what um, the Spaniards were saying, like th th that one looked very similar to this one with hair. So we have hairless, we have uh, uh, Cholos Quintle with hair, and then we have different sizes as well. There are three main different sizes. You can see the conversion here. And there are colors as well. There can be uh, this uh, dark color, they can be this pale color, they can have uh, dots of one and the other. So basically, uh, that's uh, what we have now from this uh, beautiful animal. Okay, let me tell you about the Sempasochil. You can pronounce that Sempasochil, but people nowadays is asking to pronounce that in the correct Nahuatl way, so it's Sempasochil. Uh, this uh, this species or this group of flowers is from the genus Tajetes, and it is native to the Americas. You can find it actually in the wild, and of course cultivated, but in the wild in natural natural way, um, from from Arizona all the way to Argentina. Um, it is thought that uh, the the genus is native is the center of origin is in Mexico because is where we have more uh, varieties, more species. There are more or less fifty six species in the world now that are either um, wild or cultivated. We can find them in the wild. We can find 35 of them in the wild in Mexico. And from those, we have 27 varieties that can be um, like these commercial varieties that we have now for ornamental uses. So this is these are some examples of a wild sample sochi. So you can see they are like very simple, very bright, beautiful yellow colors, but no with this um, huge number of petals or, or uh, uh, on the flowers. So those were actually cultivated since um, ancient times because uh, for the Mexicas specifically, for, for the Aztecs, the number 20 was very important every month was lasting 20 days and they had these cycles of 20 years. So the name for the flower when they uh, selected this with multi petals was Sempual 20 and Sochit flower. So the flower of 20 petals. It was a, a very important flower because the smell and the color of this uh, represented the, the sun rays and uh, they are displaying that, like, like on this photo here on, on a cemetery, as a path. Um, that one, the, the petals will guide the souls of our loved ones back to, to this level of the universe. 
but well, not only that, we can also eat it. <laughs> it's medicinal. And uh, well, you can you can just look up um, is the uses of uh, uh, tajetes or pericón. This is the one that I found to be very popular uh, in, in other places uh, uh, besides Mexico. Pericón, tajetes lucida. And supposedly it's very helpful for migraines, anxiety, stomach ache, like a lot of things. And you can prepare also a, a variety of dishes uh, with its petals. So the flowers on the on the cosmology or, or the celebration of Day of the Dead is not only um, are important, but not only the Sempasuchil, also other uh, flowers that can be purple uh, or, or violet, white, and uh, yellow and orange. And uh, it has different meanings depending on uh, which color you you want to choose. But uh, basically, this is um, what we expect to have when we go and and set up the the graveyard of our beloved one something like very beautiful so the soul is happy and it feels welcome to come and visit okay let me talk about the monarch butterfly um so i'm pretty sure that you you'll know that the monarch butterfly travels on um it starts on autumn traveling south to mexican uh, central mexican highlands to be here during the winter time I won't mention a lot of, about this because actually I have a webinar coming about migrations, so check it up and I will mention that. But the thing is that they arrive here by the time of the harvest, that is uh, October, November, and by the time of one of the celebrations of the, 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 it was the major festival of the dead that they had. So it was a coincidence that they have plus they believe that it was um, the soul of, of the relatives or the messenger of the gods. So that's why uh, in all these cultures in Central Mexico, they consider the butterflies to be the reincarnation of our beloved ones, uh, the messengers of, of the gods and goddesses, or the gods themselves, the, the deity itself. One of those deities is um, Iztapapalot, that is from the Chichimeca culture, and this was the goddess of the war and death and the hunting and sacrifice. So those are um, characteristics that we don't really associate to butterflies. They are so like fragile and so ethereal. But uh, well, for the Chichimecas, the butterflies were uh, dangerous. They were uh, fierce. And um, well, that, that's why they depicted, showed the goddess is Papalot uh, as being this um, obsidian butterfly, actually. And then uh, I want to go a little bit deep here on the Purepecha culture. They also, the Purepecha culture or, or the Tarascan is another uh, empire that was uh, fighting a lot with the Mexica, with the Aztec empire. So on this map here on the top right, this little um, uh, mark on green, shows the area of the Purepecha culture, of the Purepecha civilization. All of these, the, the darker green, is where the Mexicas were, where the Aztecs had their, um, their empire. So most of the Michoacan state, where we have our, our monarch butterfly trips, was part of this Purepecha uh, empire, from, from this Purepecha culture. And there are a lot of archaeological sites. One of those that I remember very, very happily is Tsinsunsan. Um, and it's a very, very beautiful place. There's a lot of culture, a lot of handcrafts. It's still very traditional, all of these regions on the northern part of the, of the Michoacan state. And one of the traditions that has surpassed our frontiers, that has being internationally recognized is the Day of the Dead, specifically in Janitzio Island on the Pátzcuaro Lake. So uh, this is just a, a photo from one of the cemeteries of the of the cemetery of Janitzio in this area. So you can see how I, I consider this like very beautiful. How beautiful it looks because um, I mean it's a cemetery. You usually uh, think that a cemetery is very 
very sad, very dark, uh, scary, but not in Mexico. So I want to tell you before we finish with this, a legend from the Purepecha culture that I consider very beautiful and basically uh, uh, has all of the cosmovision related to butterflies from the central part of Mexico. The legend is Paracata. And uh, it says that um, this group of people, before they were, they, they, they call themselves, themselves Purepechas, they were living in very cold areas, very high mountains. So they decided to move down, to move low in lower areas to find a better uh, uh, climate, a better environment. On the way there, all of the, uh, the oldest people and all of the little ones were very tired. Uh, some people got sick, so they stopped there to rest. And uh, these people mentioned like, we catch up later. You keep walking, we see you later. During the nights, the Purepecha people used to pray to their moon goddess that is called Nanakutsi. And uh, the, the, to pray for her help for, for these uh, weak people, sick people. One of the nights she saw uh, the, the people that was left behind that were very tired or, or sick, uh, that they were covered themselves themselves with pollen and with the, resi the, the resin of the trees. So they were warm. She was very sad. So she decided to use her magic, her, her powers of goddess and turn them into butterflies, into monarch butterflies and name them paracatas. So when they were turned into these butterflies, they were able to fly fast and catch up with their relatives and be on the forest uh, around where, where the relatives live. And that's what we saw on the, on the monarch butterfly trips that we have. So I consider that a very beautiful uh, legend too that I wanted to share with you. Um, okay, so one thing that I wanted to to, to point out is that Day of the Dead is not a Mexican Halloween. <laughs> Halloween is one celebration. It has a syncretism of the um, Catholic Church with the Celtic uh, rites, if I remember correctly. And then we have Day of the Dead that is a syncretism of the pre-Hispanic traditions with the um, Catholic rites. But not because... It doesn't matter. We can celebrate both. <laughs> we like to celebrate Halloween in Mexico. It's becoming very popular, actually, because you can uh, have these this costumes and, and celebrate on October 31st. But then you can also have a celebration November the 1st and November the 2nd. So actually, we, just, we didn't change one for the other. We just make this a, a larger celebration, three days of celebration. So feel free to celebrate. Um, you are very welcome to celebrate Day of the Dead back home. Uh, so it's it's some it's a different tradition, a part of uh, um, a way of celebrate the life of the people that was here before us. So basically, that's it, Rob. I think we have some questions. We can go. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Now, before we start in with the questions, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. So we do have a couple. Uh, so um, let's talk about the artwork for a second. In the beginning, you showed uh, the babies uh, and the wet nurse tree. It, it seemed to have some uh, European or more modern influences. Do you know how old those were and um, what, what the origin of that artwork is? Yes, no, this, this artwork, it's actually from this year, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> because I, I, yeah, I took this from um, it's a Mi Corazón Mexica at Mi Corazón Mexica. It's a, it's a Mexican American that is bringing back a lot of these different um artworks from the Mexica times. So I, actually, if you have the chance to look that, it's um, uh, I think it was on Instagram from what I took the, the screenshot. Uh, and yeah, of course it is completely modern, this one, but this one is the actual representation from uh, the Codex Rios from, uh, I think it was 1580 something or 60 something, but from the 1500s, late 1500s. So this is the real one. 
Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, what about the artwork depic depicting the ceremonies? How old is that artwork? This one. Uh -huh. The same is basically the same, the Codex Borbonicus. Um, yeah. All of these Codex, if you, if you Google those, uh, the Florentine Codex, the Duran Codex, another there are like 14, 17. All of those were made during the conquer period from 15, the, the, the priest, the Catholic priest arrived here like maybe three or four years after the Spanish conqueror. So that was 15, 25, 21. Let's say 15, 25, when they started like collecting this up to 16, early 1600. So in that period of time is where we find all of these that are labeled as codex. And uh, it was actually something that this, the, the priest from the, from the Spanish uh, Catholic church, they wanted to preserve this um, before we had the, the Inquisition coming. But uh, yeah, it's more or less on those dates late 1500s, early 1600s. Great, thank you. So are the food offerings for the dead, are they ever actually eaten? What happens to that food? Just out of well, curiosity. Yeah, it depends who you ask. I eat it, <laughs> honestly, because uh, I mean, it's fresh fruit or it's fresh uh, food. Uh, in my, my last years here, I, I've been placing um, artificial uh, flowers, artificial everything. So we don't have like these leftovers or, or a lot of uh, trash after. But um, in, in many places they eat it, but they say the, the belief, the tradition says that the spirits will feed on the smell, on the taste of the food. So if you eat the food from an altar, it will be tasteless, plain. But um, I I in it I have eaten it and uh, they still taste the same, but they are cold, <laughs> very cold, and sometimes the bread is very hard. But uh, yeah, you can eat it, definitely. How long? <clears throat> excuse me. How long are the altars left up? The tradition says that you can start setting them up on October twenty seven, and you clean it up on November the third. A lot of people only set them up from one, the, the first and the second of November, and then on the fourth, stay on the third, they they remove it. Um, the very ancient tradition that that already has the syncretism with the Catholic Church it started on September, but just for practical purposes, you can set your altar on a Halloween night on October thirty first. Is the see thirty first. And you can uh, remove it. You can clean the the area on November the third. That would be the the moment. Got it. Thank you so much. So, um, why are, do the dogs have to be hairless? I mean, why are the dogs hairless? And is there is there a genetic advantage to them being hairless? Could you talk about that a little well, bit? Yeah, I don't really, I, I didn't find any like information saying oh, it's better to be hairless than rather than have hair. Uh, what I read is that this was a mutation that just happened. And for the Aztecs, for the Mexicas, before they were Mexicas, for the Aztecs, um, all these people in the central area of Mexico, they saw that as if the dog the dog was chosen by the by the gods so let's say for example that he was the, the dog was touched or embraced or uh, by the god and it loses the the whole uh, hair so it was a mutation a random mutation that it happened and they saw it as a message from the gods to keep the the breed like that um, an adventure advantage per se uh, not really because they actually are very de uh, delicate. They, they are very sensitive to their skin. They require like um, special 
is the cares on the on their skin. Uh, but well, an advantage for us is that they are uh, hypoallergenic. So if you are a people that is allergic to four to the four of, of pets, you can have a shoulder squintly and you will be fine. And they don't have ticks or uh, any other para ex exoparasites. So that's the only that would be the only advantage <laughs> that I can see. Great, thank you. Now, um, is the Day of the Dead is it, is this the wrong time of year if I want to come see the monarchs? No, it's actually the best time of the year. Uh, we actually, for what I saw on my there's a, there's a group we have on on Facebook and they notify. They are already at the sanctuary. They arrived on uh, November the 3rd to the sanctuaries in Michoacan. Uh, for what I've heard of the local people, they say December, there's like a, this misconception that February is the best month to go and see the monarch butterflies. But the thing is that it doesn't matter what month you go, the weather is what matters. So December, we have a lot of sunny days. Uh, uh, January, we have pretty much all of the month is sunny. Uh, so uh, December and January, for what I've heard, is also very, very good. And since it's still very warm, they can be very active as well. Uh, uh, if the weather goes a little bit cooler, even in the same moment that we are over there on the sanctuaries, the monarch butterflies go and, and uh, rest and save energy for the sunny moment of the day. But yeah, I mean, this is the moment, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning uh, of this slide, we are starting on, on December, our season with not have. Uh, so yeah, you can check. I think there are still some places available for this month. Check, if not for, for January, there are still some, I'm, I'm sure of that. So uh, yeah, this is this is the time of, of the of the season to come. Perfect. Thank you, Melissa. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, yeah. that's going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to throw it back to you for some closing comments. Yes. Well, um, I hope you you enjoy this. This is uh, it's my favorite tradition of Mexico. I truly consider we are all the same. Uh, there are no races. There are no once we we pass this level, we go name it to the Nirvana or to the Valhalla, to heaven, we are all the same. We are energies. And uh, let's remember that we are always connected to nature. We, we just had that uh, reminder from the Otis hurricane. We depend on nature. So let's keep that in mind and enjoy at the same time as um, taking care of it. Thank you. And thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you could send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us Monday for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out next week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.